Great to be here. Great to be here with a great panel. And um, we're going to start off, I think, right now as we close that door. <laughs> Discovering value in turmoil. Obviously, things have calmed a little bit in the last month or so. But early this year, there was uh, true turmoil. And just going back, some might argue, some do argue, academics and others, that we're in an age of financial bubbles. If you go back to 97 with the Asian crisis, then you had uh, maybe uh, you could say the tech boom, obviously, is something of a bubble, housing, gold, you can go on and on. There are bubble after bubble. So in this age of turmoil and volatility, we thought we'd assemble a, an interesting panel to discuss how do you make money in that kind of environment. Um, I think we're going to ask everybody to just say a few words, introduce themselves to you guys, and then we'll take it from there. Why don't I start with Glenn uh, to my right. Hey, hi, Glenn August, founder and CEO of Oak Hill Advisors. Uh, we run about $28 billion of capital and bank loans, high yield, stressed, distressed, direct lending, CLO, debt and equity, RMBS, busted hull loans uh, in the U.S. and a European business. John Calamos, uh, global CIO and founder of uh, Calamos Investments. Uh, we run about $20 billion, uh, mainly in convertibles and in equities and have a variety of uh, strategies. I did introduce myself properly. Greg Zuckerman, reporter at the Wall Street Journal. Uh, my name is Matthew James. I am head of research and chief strategist at CQS, which is a credit uh, asset manager that runs around 12, $12.5 billion of uh, credit long short, uh, as well as long only. Hi, I'm Matthew Nacharian from Babson Capital. Um, I run the structured credit team there that invests in CLO uh, debt and equity primarily. We have about a $12 billion portfolio of those investments. Hello, I'm Ann Walsh. I'm the Assistant Chief Investment Officer with Guggenheim Partners. We have about $200 billion of assets under management. My responsibility is uh, uh, fixed income, for which we have about $140 billion under management. Thank you very much, everybody. We'll fixed income heavy this panel, but we can talk about other things as well. Each of these uh, panelists is an uh, experienced veteran in the business, so can talk about other things. So let's talk about, first off, where volatility is going to come from. Where do you expect it? Where do you worry about? What are the concerns and, and, and kind of maybe an area or two that we hadn't really thought of uh, to anticipate a future volatility? Glenn, you want to start us off on the right? Uh, sure. So it, it, we could talk about the answer to this question for a long, long time. Uh, I'll give a few headlines. Uh, one is China, China's conversion from a consumer industrial <laughs> economy to consumer services. We have seen dramatic impact of what that means to commodities, uh, to shipping. Uh, we're not done. The bounce that we had in the first quarter, in my view, came because China did stimulus, bought a bunch of iron ore. Prices go up 50 percent. Everyone feels a lot better. But the fundamental conversion in China is going to go on for many, many years. And I think just like we had the whole China set of issues in August that led the Fed not to r raise rates in September, we had the obvious challenges. Um, uh, in, in January and in the first quarter of this year. Um, secondly, European financial system. Uh, obviously, we're on the eve of a, almost on the eve of a Brexit vote. Uh, and what happens to the European Union? What happens to the European financial system? The fact that Deutsche Bank stock opened the year down 36 percent, and the German finance minister had to come out to the world and say, we feel comfortable about Deutsche Bank was very, very reminiscent to me about what people said about Bear Stearns in 2008. Uh, and the fact is Deutsche Bank and Commerce Bank are still trading pretty much near their February lows. Mm -hmm. And I just think it's a concern that uh, people have about the mark to market, the, the whole regulatory environment, the continued uh, low growth. Uh, I think there has been uncertainty. Clearly, energy uh, has caused enormous volatility. The correlation between oil prices and equity prices has been remarkable. Uh, everyone feels better today uh, with oil in the mid-40s than they felt when oil was in the high 20s. Uh, but how oil and commodities go does drive a lot of the market. Uh, in, and then I was going to say two more things because I could keep on going longer. But uh, again, there seems to be this question about U.S. recession versus U.S. raising rates. And again, I've been to a number of the panels over the last couple of days and everyone wants to say, well, we're really concerned that the Fed is going to raise rates. And the same discussion, the comments are, you know, we're really concerned that U.S. growth is really low. Well, last time I checked, I think that you need to have some growth to actually have rates go up. 
there could be some stagflation. We could have a long conversation about that. But uh, where the U.S. economy is, it certainly would appear to me, I think to most people, that at best we're in low growth. Uh, the fact that the 10-year Treasury has rallied 50 basis points in the first uh, in the first, four, in the first two months of the year it did, and it's kind of hung around there. So, uh, And then the last thing I would just say is in terms of volatility, we are at an incredible moment of volatility, I think, for two reasons. Uh, one is there's enormous correlation amongst and between different asset classes. So again, I mentioned oil uh, uh, and the correlation with equities. Uh, there's been enormous correlation across all asset classes. And when you have that correlation, when someone wants to exit the market, that causes there's no bid side for it. And that issue is exacerbated by the well-discussed, often discussed, mismatch of liquid funds with illiquid assets and also exacerbated by the fact that the street has taken so much capital out of the market for regulatory reasons. So any change to the downside and to the upside is enormously significant, very rapid, and that creates greater volatility. Well, it, it seems uh, I agree uh, with that, so I won't repeat uh, what has just been said. Um, but the one... Uh, one thing I'll add is I think there's been too much emphasis on monetary policy, not enough on fiscal policy. And uh, one of the, uh, seems that's all we talk about, what's the Fed gonna do, what's the Fed gonna do? Uh, but we don't talk enough about fiscal policy. And obviously, how fiscal policy may or may not go uh, is gonna create turmoil in the market going forward. Uh, we need a better fiscal policy uh, because we, the Fed wants inflation. That's what they want. So uh, they've lowered rates to zero and they haven't gotten it. Uh, but, uh, you know, our, our sense is uh, the economy is not going into a recession uh, where it's sort of a slow growth global economy. Uh, and uh, I, I think uh, if inflation starts to come back, which I think it will, I think the risk is going to be in the bond market, not the equity markets. Mm. Matt? So I was just thinking... Um, the, the list of potential sources of volatility, which I agree with completely, is, is long and um, actually makes me nervous. <laughs> but um, I also was thinking we're all fixed income credit players here. And so naturally, we're all used to asymmetric returns where, you know, if everything works perfectly, you get your coupon. Otherwise, you're dead. Um, what I think is I agree completely with the list in terms of sources of volatility, but uh, what I think is interesting now in terms of how to look at it is that we have to change the way we trade. Uh, we have to look at in terms of asset managers as saying, okay, liquidity is going to be different. Volatility has always been there, always will be there. But in terms of the, the time and cost of getting into a trade and getting out of a trade, uh, it's, it's going to take longer. It's going to cost you more. And one big element is that the street or risk capital is, you know, from prop desks, everything else have come out of the system. And so that basically makes it harder, but it also means that we have to adopt. And I think that is something that, that the whole industry is in the process of, of going through this, this change. Mm. But I actually think it's a good thing because you mentioned before in January, February, where, um, credit, and particularly in high yield credit, you know, assets sold off markedly. Uh, that was a great time if you had cash and liquidity. You could buy things really cheap. I like that. And now I think those type of V-shaped moves you're going to see more and more going forward. And I think it, it's, you know, if, if you kind of prep your investment strategy to kind of make sure you have liquidity available, whether it's naturally generating or just have cash, and recognize the option value of cash when things get weird. And uh, you know, volatility is actually, in many ways, our friend. We're traders. So, so to come back to your point, I agree completely with the list. And the list when I s of things that will make things noisy in the next 6 to 18 months is long, and that's good. D d excuse me, does that imply that you guys hold more cash or liquidity than in years past before these changes? I think uh, you have to, as an asset manager, you have to think about, as I mentioned, the option value of cash or the, the, the you know, you want to have cash 
when things are very cheap and very distressed. And so you have to manage your portfolio as such. And so do we hold more cash? We manage our liquidity. Yes, actually. As, or, as or, or Greg, if I just may, one, one quick follow on is, if you have funds that are structured with longer term locked up capital, that obviously solves that issue. Yes. Um, and so again, I think it is all about having capital ready to seize on the opportunity. I just have to also say one other thing, which is, I don't think, and we all have different backgrounds here, there's trading opportunities when you have less capital in the market, more volatile swings, there's clearly those opportunities if you have the right capital. But it's not all asymmetric, obviously, with distressed investing. It's not all asymmetric with, with prices. When prices go down 10, 20, 30, 40 points, there's lots of opportunity. Um, and I think being positioned to seize on that opportunity is pretty important. Matt? Oh. Sure. You know, when you think about all the comments that have been made so far, they're very focused on macroeconomic risks. And ever since the financial crisis ended and we've been supported by central banks globally, um, and markets, as, as Glenn pointed out, have been very, very correlated in that time, we've seen credit in general supported by this type of environment. Whereas historically, there were you know, more specific business cycles within industries uh, that, that led to default cycles based on uh, sort of the more micro level of what's going on in a particular industry. We've started to see that with what's been going on with commodity prices and oil and gas. And I think um, we're st the macroeconomic uh, issues that have been raised, I think, will continue to be the primary driver of the volatility. But I think we're going to continue to see more industry-specific uh, issues arise because of the slow growth environment that we've been in. So that the cycle has persisted a long time. The slow growth um, in general is good for high-yield credit, but I think it's, uh, you'll start to see more and more issues arise. More defaults, you're predicting. Yeah, but I think they'll be more industry specific. So, you know, it's, we have pretty good visibility uh, that it's all in energy uh, over the next year. But I think over the next uh, couple of years, you're going to see more industry specific uh, things as, you know, a lot of the issues that are discussed as this, at this conference uh, across many industries uh, come to play. Nice. Yeah. Well, one of the benefits of being the last speaker on this topic is I can just <laughs> say ditto. Um, <laughs> but I would add a few more uh, elements as well, uh, something we've all kind of touched on a bit. Uh, but particularly is globally central banks have been attempting to really push hard on uh, monetary stimulus, uh, as John mentioned, uh, to maybe the detriment of or leaving behind fiscal policy uh, uh, developments and or um, uh, repair, if you want to call it that. Uh, and so as a result, from a monetary policy standpoint, we've got one tool in the toolkit that we've been using. Mm. Um, what we've ended up creating is a tremendous amount of excess um, uh, monetary stimulus, governments buying back their own securities, uh, and uh, not just their own government or uh, sovereign uh, securities, but now also entering into other markets. And you have one big buyer uh, that's, I think, causing uh, further dislocation in the markets in terms of pricing, price discovery, uh, and, uh, and so the question is, from my view, is are investors actually even getting paid for the additional risks? And the perception that they're not, uh, I think, tends to result in these, what you mentioned, Matt, these V-shaped uh, uh, price uh, you know, um, uh, extremes. Uh, that are happening. When investors feel like they're not getting compensated for risk, they're going to exit those markets. When they, they find that, well, maybe we've kind of reached some sort of equilibrium, we'll come back. Uh, but I think a lot of that is being driven by this sort of central bank environment that we're in uh, globally. Uh, and I know we'll spend some more time talking about that as the session goes on. Thank you. So Matt made an interesting point that for a professional manager, be it a hedge funds or mutual funds, the V-shaped markets, this volatility, this era volatility, should be really helpful. Um, it gives you guys an opportunity, especially if you have liquidity, to take advantage and, and buy bargains, et cetera. And yet, the performance of hedge funds and mutual funds for years has been really poor. H how do you explain that? How do you put two and two together, and how does that inform your investing? Do you want to take a shot at that? Uh, well, I think that uh, what's happened in the U.S. economy uh, and in the U.S. markets, as we've been in this low-growth environment where, in fact, the equity indexes have tripled in the last eight years, so seven years. That's pretty good. So the question is, why have hedge funds underperformed? We have a credit specialty. We're focusing prim primarily on long-only 
uh, and really niche value opportunities, but large scale positions as well in bank loans and high yield. What I would say is that uh, for equity hedge funds, and we, we certainly have knowledge about long short equity hedge funds, the growth in a handful of stocks has driven so much of the hedge fund industry. The short side has been very, very difficult. With the exception in the credit market, the, the short side has not been so easy except for the last 12 months with regard to energy. Uh, and so I think the hedge fund structures personally with the very high fee load of one and a half, two and 20 make it very, very difficult for investors. Um, I think that's, that's the one comment. The second comment I'd make is uh, we are in a world of low risk free rates. Now whether we've gotten there just because the central banks of the world have been spending hundreds of billions of dollars buying, trillions of dollars buying, we're in a world of low rates. Low rates, low growth. So you can't have, if risk-free rates are at zero or negative to positive two, it is unrealistic to expect that the smartest brains in the world are gonna be able to generate 10, 15, 20% on a consistent, regular, oh, and by the way, hedged basis. It's just a false premise. And so the question for investors, people who either allocate capital or people deploy capital, is to figure out where can you earn a, a fair risk-adjusted return given what the market is offering every day. And I think it has been incredibly difficult because we're in a tough environment. It's been incredibly difficult for asset allocators because they have the demands, as everyone knows, whether it's 7 or 8% pension demands, whether it's sovereign wealth funds uh, who are looking to diversify. It's very, very difficult. And the challenge for all of us is to figure out where we can make some money, where we think we're getting well paid for the risk that we're taking, whether it's credit risk, whether it's interest rate risk, whether it's liquidity risk, whatever kind of risk we're taking. And I just think it's a difficult environment. But we're all paid. We're all challenged to, to face that challenge. And, and I, think, I think that we can do it. And I imagine we'll talk about ways we try to do it a little bit later. Yeah. And, you, and feel free to pass, too, by the way, tent panel. If you, feel, <laughs> if you like passing, that's fine, too. Yeah. You have enough questions. Uh, well, within uh, this volatile uh, area, I think uh, what happens <coughs> is uh, trying to really predict the short term ups and downs of the market is extremely difficult. You could get it right once, you could get it right twice, and then give it all back on the third time. So uh, I think investors uh, have to think a bit uh, longer term through the volatility. Uh, that's, uh, I think the opportunities are more in uh, low volatility strategies here that bake in the downward protection without a market timing type of attitude because uh, you know, if you get it right, you're the hero, you, you get the headlines, and then uh, the next year <laughs> you're out of business, that type of thing. So uh, it does provide opportunity, I think, in here for low volatility type of strategies. So I, I, I think it's a very <clears throat> interesting question in that you know, I've looked at over the last three to five years in terms of credit hedge fund performance, and you're right, it's not been great in aggregate. Um, and I, I think it gets back to a point that we've all touched on before, is that the environment now is different, and you, as, as allocators of capital or investors, you have to basically look at more patient mandates, more patient kind of liquidity structures, and basically the way that credit hedge funds will be trading going forward is going to be much different given the V-shapes, given the reduced liquidity, given the harder and the longer time it takes to get in, in and out of trades. Um, so I, I guess I, I think the rules have changed a bit. And I, I think hedge funds are right now in the, in the process of shifting. And that shift is going to be through broader mandates, less tied in or handcuffed, and probably, you know, 30-day, you know, 90-day liquidity is probably not ideal. It's, you're going to want longer terms. Yeah, I think, you know, given that uh, we all mentioned correlation has really gone up and volatility has gone up, uh, that makes it a, a lot harder to find alpha and to monetize that alpha. You have to have the timing right, and individual securities may not be uh, tracking uh, as differently. You would think there'd be more alpha in that kind of environment, not less. When, if a placid market, I would think, is 
makes it harder, no? Um, I don't well, you know, what I'm thinking about, maybe more specific to CLOs, is where you're trading diverse portfolios of credit. That for many years now, since the crisis, they were trading right on top of each other. People were making very little distinctions in how they were trading uh, between one another. But now that we've seen more specific industry volatility in energy, now you can differentiate the performance. And now you, the alpha is finally coming through in the last year or so, where for many years it really wasn't. That's really interesting. And so he, at least hedge funds involved in this sector, where they add to volatility because they do purchase uh, in a financed way. They have mark-to-market financing. Um, it's really given, I think, real money investors an opportunity um, to, to pick up uh, attractive investments and to ride out that volatility. You know, one of the issues uh, that we're seeing, you mentioned hedge funds, but also mutual funds, uh, public funds are having this challenge. Again, I go back to the point about investor preference. You know, investors have really um, uh, seesawed from uh, one particular view on credit or on the markets to another, moving into and out of uh, entire sectors or asset classes. And in the mutual fund space, this is a particular challenge uh, to make those redemptions, especially where, and we're, I know that the um, regulators, the SEC and, and other regulators, have spent a great deal of time uh, expressing concern over liquidity uh, for these particular products. Uh, and you know, the products themselves uh, are probably not in alignment with the underlying asset classes. So you end up having to hold extra cash to be able to meet redemptions on whether it's an ETF or a mutual fund, for example, bank loan product. Uh, and uh, rather than trying to address the structural design elements that probably create this misalignment, uh, we end up just building cash, which also presses down uh, potentially returns uh, in a risk-on environment in particular. Obviously, it kind of helps us in the risk-off environment. But then that's when the redemptions are coming in. Uh, and, and the reality is, is that most investor behavior, and Dr. Danny Kahneman, uh, Nobel Prize winner in economics, who's a psychologist, said we trade too much. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize in economics for decision theory. And individual investors trade too much, but so do institutional investors. And something we were kind of touching on, and I, I think it needs to be brought out, is the fact that the timeline for investment needs to move much longer in periods of high volatility over the course of time relative to sort of short-termism uh, or just this reaction mode that so many investors have be, really gotten into uh, over the last number of years, really post-crisis. Concerned, oh my gosh, I'm going to lose every dollar of my investment. I have to shift to cash. Okay, well now that's not earning me anything. Now I have to shift into something else. And that's creating even more of this V-shaped um, volatility that we're reflecting on. Great. I'm going to throw out a couple of potential areas of volatility over the next year or so. Tell me, th tell me if anybody wants to jump in, tell me which of these you're more concerned about. Rising inflation, rising deflation, and passing 2% on the 10-year. We're seeing bond yields going up lately, psychologically maybe. That's an important area. E any of those kind of get you nervous, you worry about or people out there who are investors or allocators should be thinking in terms of future uh, areas of volatility? Anybody want to jump in there? Rising inflation, that's good news. <laughs> They've been trying to do it for years. And if you look at inflation and uh, all this income inequality they're talking about, why is that there? Lack of inflation. Mm. The middle class has grown their wealth through inflation, through increasing real estate values over that period when you look back in history. So this, I think the big risk is deflation, and that's why the Fed is so focused on, gee, how do we get inflation going again? But like I said earlier, it's not just them. They can't do it by themselves. It's, it's got to be, uh, you have to help small business uh, grow because small business is where job growth comes from. And um, uh, what I heard at the conference here is there's, uh, there's now people out there taking a role that the banks had before and starting to create companies to loan to small business which I think is a great idea because the banks can't do it. And they, when their yield curve's like this, they're not going to loan any money out. So if we can get the small business going again, then we'll see job creation and we'll see uh, some inflation. Now, hyperinflation is a different story, but uh, I don't think we're worried about that at this point. Somebody else want to uh, throw out an idea? I guess I was thinking about your question, and I, I agree with you, inflation would be a good thing. Yeah. 
But I also, you know, there are many people at this conference and many smart people at the Fed, Bank of England, every place else that, that have been trying to generate inflation yeah. and failing. Um, so I, I don't know if we're going to get it anytime soon. But when I think of the 10 year mm. at 2%, or when I think of five year, five year forward, or uh, just look at rates overall, I get one message, and that is basically not a lot of growth anytime soon. And so when I look at that. Despite the rise in the blip in yields going a little higher lately, OK. Yes. And so when I look at that, um, from a macro perspective, that bothers me on, you know, uh, on an asset allocation perspective for over the next five plus years. Mm -hmm. But it, when I also look at it from a uh, spread product, it's actually not so bad. In fact, I would argue it, yeah. it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, when you have the. Uh, dividend yield and the earnings yield on the equity market higher than the 10-year bond, I don't see the bubble there. Mm. Yeah. That's, you know, uh, so unless, well, what we really need, quite frankly, is a normal interest rate environment. That's what the Fed would love to do. And obviously, they've had a very difficult time getting back to a normal interest rate environment. Maybe the we're not likely to see one anytime soon, actually. What's that? <laughs> the rate we're going, I don't think we're going to see one anytime soon. Doesn't look that way. Just a, just yeah. a few things. W one is, I get the we would like inflation, that there's, a, there's some positive benefits to that. Um, but again, if we have inflation, we do, we do have, I guess, what, 17, 18 trillion of debt. Uh, and the interest rate cost on that has been, ext it's been extraordinarily low. The government's been an enormous beneficiary of it. There are some people who say we should actually borrow tons more at these low rates, lock them in and do fiscal stimulus. Okay, so A, be careful what we wish for as it relates to the cost of operating the government. It'll force B, decisions, right, it'll force right. fiscal B, the reality is we're not having fiscal stimulus in the US. We're not getting it. Okay, we're not, the, 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 again, you can get it in Canada, that's great. You can get it in China because they control it. But there's no signs from a political perspective they were going to have fiscal stimulus, yeah. which is why the fixed income markets are telling you that we're going to have low growth because you just can't fight the fight by monetary policy alone. And it would be great, one might argue, if we had some fiscal stimulus, but this whole thesis of secular stagnation of just staying here, I mean, they're giving people money away and we're not investing it. People are buying back stock. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> extraordinary to me at how little capital investment there's been, but it's not coming. And so... Well, one of the benefits about inflation, though, it, it, inflation, if you look at in a deflation, as we raise our debt level, that's a real drag on, on the economy. But inflation really is a means to really kind of correct dead politicians' promises. Right. So, but, but let me take the other side made, of that for a second. They made all these promises. and, and yeah. But, but if we have, is it so bad? I mean, the, the big question, I think, from an investor perspective, besides the segmented opportunities that may come in energy in certain sectors, is when is the U.S. going to have a recession? Because when we have recession, we know what that does to markets. Mm. And a lot of people think what's going to cause recession is, in fact, if, if there's too much inflation, rates go up and that chokes off, because that's been the, the, the historical approach. We could be in a scenario where we have low growth, 1%, 2% growth for five plus years. Mm. And is that new bad? Is that, is that the new normal? There's obviously some consequences and from a social policy standpoint. But again, and that, by the way, as an aside, it happens to be good for, for some fixed income investors because, in fact, you can actually make money on spread during that time and on a relative value base, you can actually generate some meaningful outperformance. It's very challenging for the pension side because ultimately when you have 8%, you, you know, if you have 4% risk-free rates, it's easier to make 8 than if you got zero or negative. So, again, it's, it's, I'm in this... Well, I guess my point is... One or two percent. You're right. We could have that for five years if we don't change our fiscal right. policy. But, but okay, over regulation. But, but just, yeah, I think all this is slowing the economy. Yeah, I agree. Down. I agree. Yeah, and, but and that's that's unlikely to happen, as I think yeah. uh, we're all unfortunately uh, aware. Let's talk um, broadly about asset classes and what we should be excited about, what we should be nervous about here. Is it the case that if we're in a low growth environment, low inflation, you know, it sounds like no one's really too concerned about. A bond yield soaring too high that we should be reaching for yield right now and maybe go out on the spectrum there a little bit given that it sounds like a recession isn't really around the corner according to some of the uh, experts on the panel. Where, where should we think in terms of asset classes? Maybe we'll start with Anne. Well, um, if I could have slide number two um, 
talk a little bit about the fixed income environment that we're in right now. Uh, and that is that, you know, our view is, is that rates are going to be continuing to go down. Monetary stimulus is happening. Uh, uh, governments around the globe are going to continue to be pushing uh, rates down. And provocatively enough, uh, this, this trend in U.S. rates has been in place for more than 30 years and, and not ending anytime soon. So what does that do? It tells, and especially globally, as we look at other central banks pushing into negative yields. So that says to fixed income investors, well, we've got to look for yield someplace. And so you mentioned the spread sectors. Uh, and, uh, and we also have the view that there's uh, not any kind of recession coming anytime very soon. And so as a result, uh, there's a good opportunity uh, from a fundamental basis as long as we sort of stay in this one to two to three percent growth range. Three would be awesome uh, right about now. Uh, and, uh, and it's a good opportunity to buy, uh, in particular, credit. Um, talking about high yield, what are we talking about? Well, I, you know, we have a strong preference for leveraged loans, uh, bank loans relative to high yield. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, yes, uh, uh, corporate credit. And the other area that uh, I like quite a bit is CLOs. The structure works for investors in this particular part of uh, the, the, the um, uh, market cycle. Uh, so, you know, CLOs, leveraged loans, and, uh, and of course, to some lesser extent, public high yield. Again, this monetary stimulus is giving these uh, companies uh, quite a bit of runway to borrow at very, very low rates uh, and keep their businesses going very well. But I know that uh, a few of my other colleagues on the panel can speak to that even more than I can. Yeah, I mean, we've been investing in CLOs for a long time, since the late 90s, and I don't think there's ever been a more appropriate economic scenario for a strong argument for investing in CLOs. So spread product is attractive. Mm -hmm. You're getting paid well for the credit risk that you're taking well, what are you getting in paid loans nowadays in, well, in, the, in the mid to, five, mid to high 500s for a diverse portfolio That's of right. bank loans in terms of the, the discount margin that you can achieve. The coupon's a bit lower than that. Um, and if you go back a, a month, it was in the 600, so very attractive. You're getting paid for the expected default risk or overpaid for the expected default risk in our view. If you look at that big picture in senior secured loans, you're in the, the top part of the capital structure of those companies. So you're taking credit risk, but you're taking it in the most conservative part of the high yield market. And then when you add CLOs to that, you can do it in a very deleveraged basis. So a triple A CLO tranche, the entire portfolio of loans can all default. And if it recovers the his, you know, around the historical rate of 70 cents on the dollar, you, you don't lose any money. And that's incredibly strong. So th there are, it creates a tool where investors globally can uh, customize the amount of risk they want to take to the spread market. So if they're uh, worried about the economy overall, you can still do it in a very deleveraged way. On the other hand, you can make a leveraged bet. And so I think the tool uh, really is uh, very important today compared to, to what it's provided to the markets over the years. And it really does help, uh, and I think this gets, isn't focused on very much, especially by regulators, but the CLO market allows investors globally, real money investors, pensions, insurance companies, banks, to invest in a part of the U.S. corporate market that they otherwise can't invest in. They don't have teams of high yield uh, credit analysts. They're not as familiar with the companies. They rely on U.S.-based asset managers to guide them through that market, but it attracts a, a significant amount of capital at relatively low cost to support U.S. businesses, and I think that is underappreciated. Who, who dominates the CLO market today? Is it hedge funds? Is it mutual funds? Who, who are the biggest players? Um, it depends on the part of the capital structure. It's really banks, uh, very large uh, U.S. and Japanese banks at the senior part of the capital structure, insurance companies in the middle uh, tranches, and really pensions <coughs> and hedge funds uh, at the bottom part, and asset managers at the bottom part of the capital Thank structure. You. So, I so we're all we're all basically saying similar thing in terms of we're all in various degrees buying into this secular stagnation or low but positive growth view, which is good for spread product. I like high yield credit. I, I think credit uh, is going to, in terms of total return, is going to outperform equities mm -hmm. over the next 12 months. I think leveraged loans is actually probably the more interesting part of credit in terms of value, risk, reward. And I think probably the, the most interesting, attractive part of credit right now is, um, you know, is a, a CLO MES, basically double B, triple B, 
levered portion of CLO paper that's trading at 800 to 1,200 spread basis. Mm -hmm. Because you don't expect a recession anytime soon. Correct. And I, I don't expect a lot of growth either. And I like the fact that I could buy CLO MES paper and basically I have to, in order to have the first dollar of loss, I have to have default rates running at kind of 10 to 12 percent each year for mm. the next five years before I take a hit. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah, sounds attractive to me. Um, John, I, I I guess I'm a little bit more of an uh, more of an equity tilt. Uh, so I like uh, convertible bonds in here uh, because it gives you uh, my experience with them over many many. Uh, market cycles, it does give you the downside protection of volatile market and you do get the upside and, and I'm just not making a prediction we're just going to stay in this area here because if the economy like it looked like it was going to do at the end of last year uh, as rates were going off the economy was getting better as you all know that can happen very very quickly and you got to be ready for that and, and uh, I, think, uh, I think what it helps it really dampens the uh, volatility, but still puts you in place over the long term to participate in, in that growth. So it, it's, a, it's an area that, uh, uh, that has worked very, very well over many years, and uh, I, I still favor that. Go ahead. So I'll, uh, going last this time, I get to say ditto now on a lot of <laughs> stuff. Uh, I'll try to add a few other points. One is CLO structures work. They proved themselves in 2008. And I share the views on values. We like bank loans. We like CELOs, which is essentially a structural bet on, on loans. High yield is much more about being tactical. Um, and then the real question to me is how far out do you go on the risk spectrum? Mm. And notwithstanding my comment earlier that we are in a place where I believe the more likely scenario is low growth without a recession, the reality is the world does have a lot of risk. And that may, well, that may be a 75% probability, the world has risk. China could, in fact, lose control of the credit bubble, the real estate bubble. So far, they've been able to manage that. European Brexit could go, Brexit could happen, it could widen, and the European financial institutions could get more challenged. And we know what's happened on the energy side. So there's been some interesting, and I think will be some interesting distressed opportunities in energy. We know that in shipping today, the fact that a lot of dry bulk operators are operating, charging rates below their operating costs. So there's some distressed opportunities. So from my perspective as a general matter in the stuff that the fixed income people on this panel do, I think you tilt a bit towards lower risk. I think you pick your spots in distressed in trying to figure out where you can get some good downside with some interesting upside optionality and energy. I think you, you tiptoe and try and figure out how you can make money in the ripples that are coming out of the change in the Chinese economy. And then I think you sit with a lot of cash, hopefully, to be there when something goes wrong. Because one of the things that I look at today and I say, if something happened, some exogenous shock happened that was equivalent to oil shock. Okay, no one was sitting here two years ago saying oil is going down 50 or 60%. We don't know what tomorrow is going to bring, but we do know if there is any kind of exogenous shock, there's very limited policy tools in place because all the monetary policy, if that's the only politically acceptable tool, if that's the only one that's been used, there's no more gas left in that strategy. So to me, having pools of capital for distressed, I think makes sense. So I have a view take lower risk today, except for the interim lower returns try to be on the other side of the volatility, the mismatch, again, with mutual funds, ETFs, who are essentially buying into liquid products with underlying assets that are illiquid, being there on the other side of the trade in the day of those when, when there is increased volatility, I think is a great strategy. Um, that's right. I'll follow up. Uh, I asked Matt this question. Do you have more cash than, I don't know, five, ten years ago? Do you guys hold more cash than you used to? Well, we, we've just raised a substantial pool of distressed capital with standby feature to have that cash ready to go. So the answer is yes, and we have in our long-only multi-strat funds, we have been riding with a little bit more cash to be there for those moments where we see great dislocation. Is there anything else uh, somebody on the panel might want to chime in about what you do differently today, given the increased volatility relative to, I don't know, a decade ago? 
assuming that's true academically, I'm not sure, but uh, assuming that there's more volatility, anything you do, maybe you've got a wish list that you never had before, you've established a wish list within the firm, I don't know, anything that you guys do differently? I, I think credit markets overall actually are getting much more segmented in, in a way in that you can find opportunities globally across credit markets, whether it's in leveraged loans, Europe versus the US, or different sectors. And so I, I guess the fact that banks have pulled out the risk capital from the system and a lot of asset managers are more constrained in terms of their playground or their scope actually means there, there's a lot more relative value opportunities globally, hmm. I think. So, you, so are we, you investing we, we look at, never did a few years ago, that kind of thing? We look at, you know, kind of opportunities with, within leveraged loans, uh, you know, Europe versus in dollars relative to high yield bonds and how that, that mispricing looks. Or you can even look at same credits, you know, issuing in dollars versus euros, pick your currency. And, um, it's a lot more opportunities. The play, I guess my point is, as, as some, some of the investor capital has gotten more fragmented, uh, it makes for a messier playground, which I like. I think um, you know, what hasn't changed is that in less liquid asset classes, you have to underwrite as if you're going to be stuck holding that uh, bond or investment through its maturity. And that's something we've, we've always focused on. And that, you know, if anything, we're, we, we focus even harder on that. But w what has changed is you have to be a lot more nimble. Uh, the, the up and downs uh, in the market uh, force you to be ready to take advantage of opportunities. So, you know, our active management and trading uh, has certainly increased in this type of environment. So you have to be, you know, really ready to go and, and following things very closely. Yeah, I completely concur with that. We do the same thing. And, and uh, as, as uh, uh, markets have changed, so have our uh, portfolio designs and structures. Uh, for those moments in time when there isn't any liquidity, you know, a couple thoughts on liquidity. First, you know, liquidity is really kind of a myth anyway. Uh, when you need it, it's not there. Uh, and I'd really rather get paid for illiquid purchases of assets up front. If I look at the vast size of the fixed income markets, the U.S. fixed income markets are about $37 trillion. Less than half of that are assets that appear in an index. It means there's a whole lot of investment uh, opportunity out there in fixed income space that is, by definition, less liquid. And you get paid for that uh, in, in portfolio management. But you have to be thinking about portfolio design in such a way that portfolios are self-funding uh, and more holistically approach liquidity from that perspective. Uh, add the leveraged loan transactions or the short duration assets into the portfolio that, that have cash flow, amortization, or what have you, for those times when market seizure occurs and you need to fund, uh, or set up those backup lines to the extent that you need those. So, so our, our prep, if you will, for those crisis periods has become much uh, uh, broader. We, we're, we're much uh, better at planning for those events, having seen them now, uh, unfortunately, for the, the financial crisis and then even some of the, the situations following uh, the market cycles that have followed uh, the great financial crisis as well. And so as a result, um, we're spending a lot more time making sure that the portfolios themselves have all those uh, tools in the toolkit uh, for which we can then react. Uh, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an increasing challenge. One thing we haven't spent a lot of time talking about is the regulatory environment for banks and other lenders who could have provided some of those backup facilities or uh, provided liquidity through repo or other uh, elements. And the regulatory environment has become much more strained for them, and those providers aren't there. So you have to really expand uh, your opportunity set uh, today in planning for those. So I think some things have definitely changed from where we were a decade ago, uh, or certainly 15 years ago. That actually is a, is a genuine concern of mine in terms of looking at how we trade and how we do our business, is that the, the regulatory pressures on counterparties continues. And you see counterparties basically leaving. And while I can see that that, that may be a, you know unintended but positive consequence from the regulator, regulator's goals, at a certain point, you, you, you run out of counterparties in the system. Um, and so I, I guess that point. You just trade with each other, cut out the middle. <laughs> you, That's what happens. 
you know, five, 10 years ago, you could easily say I had 15 or 20 counterparties. Now you're looking at 10 or less. At a certain point, you're kind of um, getting worried. So I, I don't know if the regulators view this as a positive or negative well, development. Well, have spreads been, uh, been affected, bid ask spreads? So, so there's, there's bid ask spreads, and there's what does it really take to execute? Yeah. So the answer is yes, a lot. Okay, and yes, you have to have conviction. If, if I just might make a slightly different point, which, which I don't think gets talked about enough and what is a driving force in the volatility, is that we have the lowest coupons on corporate credit in history. Okay, and when I started in, the, in this in, in the late 80s and, and was here at the, at the Drexel Conference a long time ago, the bonds that we were looking at had 14s, 15s, and 16s on them. Twelve, the good ones were 12, 13, and 14. Um, and then we went through a period, and, and they're only because they're set up for risk-free rates, and risk-free rates were eight. And then we, in the last 20 years, as rates, the 30-year bull market and fixed income, rates went down, and then all of a sudden the average coupon was eight, nine, 10. Well, now it's kind of four, five, six, seven. And what happens is that when credit events occur that cause a repricing of that credit risk, Simple bond math is you take a 6% 10-year bond and you reprice it to 10% the next day, it trades at 75. You make it 15%, it trades at 55. With fallen angels that have 4% coupons, it goes 45 to 63, which is why when the world was melting down in the beginning of this year, there were lots of Glencore and Anglo-American and U.S. Steel bonds trading in the 40s, 50s, and 60s because they have such low coupon. And so that injects a lot more volatility. And what it really means is you've got to be ready and decide are you going to step in, is whether it's 8, 10, 12, 15. And when you compound that with the fact that there's very little covenants, because we all know about covenant lights, and we all know that we've just raised all this capital over the last few years, so maturity has been pushed out, there's going to be a lot of volatility. There's going to be some really good trading opportunities in stressed and distressed, in my views, where companies fall below their expectations and the next bid is down 10, 15, 20 points, because it really is about the large guys. One of the things we don't talk about also is the concentration on the asset manager side. So again, that takes out a little bit of the concern, but there's still frictional costs, and those frictional costs and people having that conviction to step in create some of that volatility. Did you guys do that? Did you buy some Anglo-American U.S. steel back then? We, we bought some, but not enough like anyone else. Okay. okay? And, and I will also tell you, it's great for everyone saying that they bought a lot, and, and, and in all candor, we did not buy aggressively in January, February, when the world was down 10% in equities. Okay? Forget about what high yield was down 5 Okay, When bank stocks were down 30%, when the 10-year Treasury in six weeks went from 225 at year end to an intraday low of 153 and the German finance minister, as I said earlier, saying Deutsche Bank is okay. Trust me, a lot of people aren't ready to step up in size. And that's my view. We haven't talked too much about gold, which might play a role in a portfolio if you're thinking about volatility, uh, or even equities. What do you guys think about um, the, the, the relative value of either gold and or equities here? Feel free to chime in, anybody. Well, obviously, uh, gold's done well this year. Uh, and uh, many people feel that may be a prediction for inflation coming back. So gold's been one of the best performing asset Are classes you buying gold? this year. Or you can't? No. You, you no. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, Would you recommend gold? Uh, no, I'm not recommending that. Okay. Just, Anybody else have a just view? Just watching it. Okay. Yeah. Well, gold relative to other investable assets relative, if you go back in time and you look at a history chart, gold relative to the S&P 500 or to oil prices or what have you is actually not trading at a huge premium relative to history. So it has a long way to go mm. uh, in its own cycle. I don't really think necessarily that it's a portend of inflation. I wish it was that we yeah. could get some inflation to 2 or 3% that would help us with some of the growth issues right. that, that John's referencing. But, but from my view, um, I think it's simply become an alternative asset, uh, given the fact that so many investors, individual investors in particular, have fear. Uh, it's the intrinsic value option for them to, to uh, store 
uh, value uh, and wealth. Uh, there, you know, the, we haven't really spent a lot of time talking about how savers, uh, the individual home uh, consumer saver, uh, has been harmed by the rate environment globally. But if you're a European or a, or a Japanese investor looking at, at paying effectively a safekeeping rate uh, through negative yields, uh, you're going to be looking at other asset categories that maybe you can consider a store of wealth, and, and I think gold has become that. Mm. Uh, you recommend it for those kinds of investors? I, I, it's not so much that I recommend it per se, but I certainly could see the value of it. Uh, I still think there are places that, in, uh, from my perspective, I can go and get more immediate benefit. But let's get real, CLOs uh, to an individual investor is a four-letter word, mm. and they don't understand that market. It's very institutionally driven. So if you're an individual and you have a uh, more limited uh, uh, selection of opportunities or sectors you can go to, they understand gold. Has Guggenheim increased its gold allocation? We, we have not, no, not really. Okay. There's very few, lim there's limited ways in which we can access. We're not gonna go out and buy gold coins, uh, but individuals are. We do ETFs and futures and all that kind Some. of Some. Mm -hmm. Matt, you want to uh, I, you know, I've learned over the last many years that I really don't have any insight into gold. To gold? Mm -hmm. Okay. So How about I, 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 How I, about view it, I view gold as an anti-currency, and I know anything I think about gold generally tends to be wrong. <laughs> yeah. um, I bought equities, gold. Okay. <laughs> equities, I mentioned before, I think credit uh, will outperform equities in the next 12 months. And... Uh, I go back to what I said before, is that I'm, I'm of the view of a low growth world and you're gonna have single digit returns in equities and credit. Okay. Um, I have other questions, but I'll stop here just for now and uh, I'll take some questions from the audience and then uh, if there's more time I can ask as well. I think I've we've got one right in the front. I can barely see, but I think so. So thank you so much for your thoughts and comments, guys. Um, and uh, it seems like we're having a credit love fest. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I would say a credit orgy almost. <laughs> I mean, uh, which is okay, but um, as, they generally don't end well. You know, yeah. Well, uh. you know, uh, I, I guess my question has to do with, which is a sort of a, a riff on the liquidity issue having to do with the lack of dealers, and specifically in terms of ETFs, and the fact that. You know, in this, uh, at this moment in time, it seems to me that the ETFs have changed the game a little bit. And it, we saw that in January and February when there was kind of a rush to the exit in the high yield market. So I was hoping that maybe the panelists could address how ETFs have changed the game if they have. And um, if there is some negative surprises, um, you know, at going to Glenn's point about increased volatility, do the ETFs exacerbate that, and what are you guys doing, if anything, to protect yourself as a result of the increased uh, impact of the ETFs? It's a good question. I should have thought about it. <laughs> anyone want to take a shot there? Okay. You want to take it? Yeah, I'll start. Um, so I think actually ETFs um, may prove out to be a, a volatility creator uh, in the long run. Um, you know, some people in the short run believe that, uh, that they've created liquidity. I, again, I go back to my statement, liquidity is a myth, and I think in particular with these, with these structures. Um, I do expect that the SEC will, um, will challenge or change uh, some of the liquidity elements to an ETF. Or in times of volatility, if you really can't exit an ETF, many people, many investors don't realize they could get an in-kind distribution. So rather than getting that cash that you expect out of your bank loan ETF, you're going to get a piece of a whole bunch of, of individual bank loans uh, handed out to you. Uh, and I think once that happens, I think uh, investor preference will change for the structure. Um, probably a better strategy for those in the long run would be to align the settlement provisions with the settlement provisions of, for example, the underlying asset class. So if you're gonna have a bank loan uh, ETF, Bank loans can take anywhere, we'll say, up to three weeks to settle. I think that a, an alignment of that kind of settlement provision would be critical. Otherwise, ETF providers uh, or designers or managers are going to have to increase their liquidity ability uh, inside of those uh, because they're, in times of market seizure, they're a very challenging uh, asset class to manage. But again, 
they do have the ability to, uh, to, to give in-kind distributions, which many investors would find not preferential. So the liquidity mismatch is a big problem, not, not only in the U.S. with ETFs, but with USITs in Europe. And you, you know, I, I find it a bit baffling that you could have an asset class that takes two to three weeks to settle and have daily liquidity on it. I just don't get it. Um, that said, ETFs have been, I, I would agree, they, they've been pro-cyclical, however you want to look in terms of adding to liquidity or volatility in the system. But with bond ETFs, um, I also think they're causing a differentiation in pricing. And so if, if you know, you will definitely, there's a liquidity premium for all the bonds that are in the index that the ETF tracks, HYG, mm. HYG or JNK or whatever. And the rest, off index, actually trade cheaper. So in that sense, it's kind of interesting to it gives me. Gives you opportunity? It gives you an opportunity. I don't know if it's in the whole system a good thing, mm. but it definitely is creating a differentiation in pricing. But the liquidity mismatch of the structure, it, <coughs> we, we saw it before in um, December, January, February as a problem, and it's going to come up again as a problem. Should we take uh, another question or two? We got one in the front here. Thank you for your comments. It was very interesting. Um, since the title of this session is turmoil, and everyone seems to be prepared for a turmoil, so how does a turmoil look like? Like what, what type of crisis, what, at which point you would say, OK, now it's a good time to buy? Because the issue seems to be there are no sources of actually growth. And if there is to be a turmoil, wouldn't you think, oh, it can get a lot worse than that? So. What is your level of equity sell-off or credit spread widening, or when are you going to deploy the cash? Because um, I see a lot of the managers that I allocate to sitting on a lot of cash, and everyone's hoping for a crisis, but no one mm -hmm. seems to know what a crisis looks like. When, when do you say this is, wow, a good time to buy? So, so I would just start and say that the name of this panel obviously was devised in early February, <laughs> uh, when there was, in fact, turmoil. And, the reality is when the U.S. equity market was down 10 percent, European markets down 10 to 15 percent, China down 15 to 20 percent, oil down 30, 40 percent in six weeks, financial institutions down 30 percent, we were right there. Okay? And what I would say is on February 12th, we made a right turn back, or we went a, a U-turn or a V, and if we had gone on a little further, we would have been in real turmoil. Now, I learned a long time ago, be careful what you wish for. Mm -hmm. Okay, so today we are not in a period of turmoil. The outlook for this panel is we're in a low growth world. And again, I think the way, we all challenge how do you make money in a low growth world? And what we've all said is essentially relatively low returning strategies and whether it's 5% on bank debt or 6, 7% or 8% in CLOs, dipping your toes in some distress where you maybe can make 10 to 15, taking your liquidity premiums, there's some opportunities there. And so in terms of turmoil, you need to have major dislocation. And if I may, I have to modestly correct an earlier comment in responding to uh, positions that we brought. A, we shouldn't be commenting on positions. <laughs> Uh, and B, what I would say is those three names we actually did not purchase. We did purchase other names in other sectors, software and energy and others. But, but to me, it's about turmoil is different because you don't want to have turmoil every day. You want to have some capital available to seize on turmoil. But, but if I can interject, I think that's a good question. When do you buy in when you're in the turmoil? We'll be in it again well, sometime soon. Well, it's, it's not about being 100 percent in cash and buying. Yeah, sure. It's about asset allocation. Uh, we have equity positions right now. Uh, quite frankly, I think it's going to be hard to predict when the markets turn like that. So it's really about balancing that asset allocation uh, between, let's say, fixed income, which is supposed to be very conservative here, unless interest rates go up like that. So uh, one of the things that we've done is we've used alternatives like our market neutral, which is convertible arbitrage in there because it has interest rate risk. But we're still in the equity markets because it's going to be hard to time that when that turns. So you want that right balance uh, in here because it's too hard to predict. I, I was on uh, the show in February and, and I, I just told investors, don't panic because that's what happens in these 
volatile markets, they panic, it comes back, and they're not in the markets. This is the highest concentration of retail investors in bonds. 25% of the bond market is retail investors. So we only have about a minute yeah. left if anybody wants to take a Yeah, I, I would point. just jump in quickly and say, you know, although we've had a sharp rebound, when you look at portfolios of credit, which what CLOs are, of the you know, 50 to 60 managers we track, the broadly defined energy exposure goes from 2 to 22% at, and stops at every point in between. Right? There are, there's now lots of security selection opportunities, and although the averages have gone back a lot, the distribution of spreads, especially in lower tranches of CLOs where they would be impacted by that exposure directly, um, gives a lot more opportunities today than there was uh, 12 months ago. Do you want to take a shot or we can pass because we're exactly on time. How do you like that? So thank you, the audience, for everyone's attention. Thank you, the panelists as well.